The Wind is My Mother by Hart Molly Larkin, Chapter 12, A Different Kind of Church. There's an old story about a baby girl being brought home from the hospital and her four-year-old brother asking the parents, can I be alone with her for just a little while? The parents said, not right now, but a little later, can. The next day, he asked again. So they put in an intercom by the baby's crib, turned it on and said, now you can be alone with her. The four-year-old went up to the crib and said to his baby sister, Tell me about God. I'm beginning to forget. The scriptures say, a little child shall lead them. And we say that children came here to teach us, to teach us how to be humble, teach us how to be forgiving. If you get after the child, the child cries. But later on, he forgets about it and comes back and sits on your lap. Adults don't forget so easily. We carry around old hurts and pains. What are we going to do with them? Have revenge in our hearts until the day we die? We have a tendency to forget how much we owe to the Creator. We seem to forget about Him when the sun shines in our lives. We forget until the dark times come and then we say, please help me. Churches were never made for perfect people. That's why people go to churches to draw upon the perfection of the creator to enable them to walk a few steps further in this life. The Red Road. During World War II, a question was asked as to whether the enemy we were fighting prayed to God. If they're praying to God and we're praying to God, whose side would God be on? If we're praying to the same God, we're both on the same side in the spirit. So, if you're religious, you can expound on theology and quote the Bible, but then there's another aspect of living this life, and that's the path of the Native American people called the Red Road, the road that leads to life, the road of spirituality, the spirit road. How do we become spiritual? By having an, experiment, by having an experience of oneness with the great being. We can't understand it, and we don't try to analyze it. It's a feeling in our heart and soul that inspires us. I have been asked what God Native Americans pray to. There's only one living God, but there are many ways from many cultures to contact the same God. People sometimes refer to idols as God, but idols are inanimate. I am referring to the living God. In the Old Testament, Elijah had a contest with the people who worshipped an idol ball. He said, let fire come from your God, and if it doesn't, it will come from mine, you first. They built an altar and went through their chants, rituals, dances, calling on Baal, and there was Elijah whooping it up. Maybe you need to call a little louder. Maybe he's asleep and can't hear you. Nothing happened and finally they gave up. It was Elijah's turn and he just made things more challenging. He doused the altar with water four times. Then he called on God. The altar flamed up because Elijah worshiped the living God. So the living God is one God. There are many ways people worship God and that's why there are so many churches of different denominations. Their rituals are different, the order of service are different, but it's the same God, whether you go to a Catholic church, a Jewish temple, a Protestant service, or Native American ceremony. If you're strong in your belief and your faith, then you don't have to fear what anyone else does. Native people always had recognized the living God, only we didn't know him as God in our language. We have our own names for the Creator, but the word God leaves us cold because we've read, the, we've read of the God of vengeance in the Bible, a term that connotes fear. In Native American language, we say things like, he who gives life, or the great mystery. In the Creek language, we call him Ofunga, meaning the one who oversees all things. The Christians of our tribe now call him Hisakita Nisi, the master of the breath. Whatever name we use, there's a feeling of warmth and closeness. If I'm in pain or need, I just call his holy name and he's the one who's going to understand me. 
He's the one who's going to help me with my needs. That's the kind of relationship we have when we call upon him with those names. The missionaries thought, thought our Indian people worshipped trees, eagles, pipes, and many other things. We didn't then, and we don't now. We are monotheistic, but we do acknowledge these things as gifts from the Creator put here to help us. When we use herbs such as sage, cedar, and sweetgrass, we're not worshiping these items. We're using them to create an atmosphere where we feel comfortable addressing the Creator. Whether we're in a need or just want to adore His presence. <clears throat> Part of our respect for the eagle stems from the fact that if a human looks at a mountain, he will see only one side, but an eagle can see both sides because it flies higher than any other creature and has very keen eyesight. Since the eagle flies close to the Creator above, we ask that it carry our prayers to Him. We can certainly pray directly to Creator, but using these mediums through which our messages can be conveyed shows respect because there are many people calling upon him night and day. We, in our humble appeal, ask others to help us in conveying our message to him. We might have a loved one far away who is ill, so we use the four directions, the wind to carry our good energies to them. It is the living God who makes it possible for us to feel, to sense that we are being thought of. At all times, we keep ourselves humble because we're here to help our loved ones. If we can't be there in spirit to hold their hands and speak to them, we can still leave them in the capable hands of a living God who can help them. Before we had the sacred pipe, we would touch a tree to connect to the Creator who created both the tree and our lives. If we lived in an area where there were no trees, we'd take dirt and do the same thing, touch it, then touch our bodies with it. It's not the dirt or the tree, but the Creator who made them that we're honoring. Colors, fetishes, and the four directions are not gods in themselves. They represent what is powerful, our medicine way. The Creator put them here for us to use, and they provide a sense of having a ready connection with a higher being. So the answer is that there is only one God, not many gods. The Spirit Place. Many Native American tribes have a ceremony known as the Sacred Stone People's Lodge, more commonly referred to as a sweat lodge. It's a purification ceremony in which stones that have been heated in fire are brought into the lodge. The door is closed and hot steam is created by pouring water on the stones. As a result of that heat, we perspire and get rid of many of the toxins we carry with us. A sweat lodge ceremony is not an endurance contest to see how much heat you could stand. It's a place to communicate with the Creator. The steam that rises from the stones is referred to as the breath of spirit. In the Lakota language, the name for the sweat lodge is Enipi. Any means spirit and P means place. So its name is Spirit Place, the place where we communicate with a higher being. You've heard the word teepee. Teepee is to live, so teepee means to live place. The sweat lodge is sacred place. Even though we don't call it a church, we pray, think, and act as if we were in church. That's how sacred it is. It's sacred in its construction. Prayers are made when we dig the dirt out from, to form the pit for the stones and when we build the frame of the lodge from saplings. It is said that when you are in a sacred place, you yourself become sacred. It's an old time way that our people tried to communicate with a higher power. We didn't have formal churches, so we tried to make contact the best we could by purifying ourselves first. We say we want to come before the great being with clean hands, meaning a clean attitude, a clean heart, a clean life, as clean as we can live it. That's why many of our ceremonies involve fasting and sweating so as to, 
appear before the great being clean inside as well as outside. We can go to a sauna and sweat and perspire all we want to, but it's not the same thing. When we come to a sweat lodge, there are prayers involved. There's cleansing, not only of our body, but our mind and soul, just like being born again. We erase our past mistakes and heartaches and disappointments, sweeping them clean so that when we go out, we will make new tracks. How do we communicate feelings to a higher power? The secret is humility. When we come into the lodge, the opening of the doorway is so small that we must crawl through the door on our hands and knees. That's the first lesson right there, humbling ourselves before the great being as we come in. In the circle of the sweat lodge, we first bring in seven stones that have been heated in the fire. One is for the creator and one for the earth. Four for the four directions and one more for all living things. So when we sit there, we are in a little universe. And in that little space, we can pray for any situation on our planet. We can add our love, our concern for the good of the whole world. There are many things that we can pray for from our churches and little lodges. And it doesn't matter how great or small the structure, because the one we appeal to has the greatest power of all. Some people have hang-ups about praying. There's a story of a little boy who got inspiration to pray, and he started out, God, I thank you for the beautiful mountains, the trees, and the grass. That's as far as he got. God, I have so much in my heart that I want to say, but I don't know how to pray. I do know the alphabet, though. Listen, real good God, as I repeat the alphabet, maybe you can put it into words and make a beautiful prayer from this alphabet. Even if we don't know how to pray, we can still communicate what's in our hearts to a great power. Although he already knows how we feel and what our situation in life might be, it's best to acknowledge it ourselves and say, this is my situation, I need your help, and we're going to get that help in some way. It's good to come right to the point when we pray. In the lodge, we're told to say it, and that's it. We're not out to impress anyone. When I'm conducting a sweat lodge ceremony, I tell people not to make the prayers too long because you're going to have to walk with those prayers. And when you go out of the lodge, if they're too long, they might snag on something and you'll trip on your own prayers, make them short enough so you'll remember what you prayed for. When you back up those prayers by how you live outside of the lodge and things will fall into place for you. Prayer is a matter of communication from our hearts to the one who's going to listen regardless of our station in life. We're praying to the creator who understands and loves us. Many times I've seen some of the old people sitting in one of our ceremonies praying in their own language because they're very limited in English. They pray for people who have undergone disaster. When they hear of countries where little boys and girls were made orphans overnight, they say, put a good thought in the heart of someone to pick up a little orphan child and say, I love you. Here's some food. Here's a little doll you can play with. The tears stream down as they pray for the future, for the good in people. We can pray for those things if we are spiritual. The spirit just works. It doesn't think in terms of distance. It doesn't think in terms of time. The heartbeat of the creator. On the altar outside the sweat lodge is what many today call a pipe rack. We rest the sacred pipe against it until we're ready to smoke it in the lodge. The elders taught that it's not really a pipe rack, it's half of a burial scaffold. Instead of burying their dead, some tribes put them on a scaffold so that nothing comes between the body and the Creator. Half a scaffold shows that we are here on this planet, are cognizant of the world above, and so we use half of the scaffold to rest the pipe, which reaches 
between here and the other world. When we use a drum, we're aware of the spirit inside. Symbolically, everything that gives life in the universe is represented inside the drum. The wood was once a tree that had life-giving substances flowing beneath its bark, just like blood going up and down our bodies. And the skin covering the drum was once life. It surrounded a body and there was life flowing beneath it. Both the skin and the wood were related to life that's gone on, yet they are helping the lives that are still here. What this drum represents to us is a heartbeat. As we dance to the tempo of the drums, we're dancing in harmony with the heartbeat of our Creator, which is life. And the people dance together, we are all in harmony with our fellow man. This drum beat is a pulse rather than a tempo. It's a life pulse. If anyone is feeling great pain from a heart condition and you have nothing on hand to give that person, just beat a drum steadily while you're waiting for help. The spirit of the one who gave us life, the life form of all life forms, is being called upon. And in time, that person's heartbeat is going to catch up with a drum beat. You don't have to be a great medicine person to do this. You just have to have a lot of love in your heart and to be able to do it. A lot of concern for your fellow man. That's why the drum is a sacred instrument to us. Then there is a spirit of the fire. In our Indian way, we say the fire is the sun here with us. The sun shines on the trees for days, weeks, months, and years, and the wood absorbs the sunlight. Then the tree is taken down, and when we put a flame to it, that sun is now here with us in the form of the fire. We also say fire came to us a long time ago. So, so it's, it's our grandfather. When that wood burns up, it turns gray like an old man, a grandfather, and we give it the same respect we give to our elders. To be a fireman in our ceremonies is a position of great honor. Non-Indians have a fireman who puts the fire out. Ours starts the fire. When a fireman handles the fire, he handles it very gently because he's handling an old person. He doesn't shove the wood around because dishonoring the fire has its penalties. It can warm us, give us energy, and cook for us, but it can also burn us our loved ones, or our homes. So we always respect that fire. We're very gentle with it, like an old person. When the fireman puts the flames out, they do it very gently. They don't take water and douse it all at once. They do it very gently because they're not putting the fire out. They're putting grandfather to sleep. They're thanking grandfather for helping us and saying, now you've earned your rest. We thank you for helping us. There may be a time when we're going to have to wake you up again and ask you to help us, but right now, we want you to sleep. The fire that burns in our fireplace is the eternal fire. It is the sun here with us, lighting our way among the different Indian tribes. We respect the fire that way. The sacred hoop. Both the sweat lodge and the teepee are around. In fact, most native dwellings are around. We even have a dance we call the round dance. A circle is without end. There's no time element to any part of it. When people come together in a circle, there is a spirit of oneness, a sense of sacredness that comes from inside us. The circle contains an appreciation, an acknowledgement, of all the created forces at our command, if we so desire. Our old teaching is that the universe is in harmony as long as we keep the sacred hoop intact. The sacred hoop is our circle of all life. The four directions, the earth, and everything that lives on the earth. It includes not only the two legs, but also the four legs, the winged, those that live in the waters, and those that crawl on the earth even the plant life. Everything is part of the sacred hoop and everything is related. Our existence is so intertwined that our survival depends on maintaining a balanced relationship 
with everything within the sacred hoop. So the circle represents the universe. It represents all of creation united together as relatives. In our way of adopting a relative, we say, now your problems are my problems and my problems are your problems. This is how we conduct ourselves with the, when the sacred hoop is intact. As long as that hoop is intact, then we feel safe. But in this day and age, it's every man for himself and survival of the fittest. The hoop has been broken many times over because of man's disregard for his fellow man, the earth, and those that live upon her. What is the old American spirit? Why did the early founders of this country print on the dollar bill in God we trust? Years ago, if a farmer's house burned down, it would be put up again in a few days later. All the neighbors would be there to help, to assist, to rebuild. The American spirit was that of helpfulness, of trying to live with common interests that served all the people. Then states were formed and governments expanded their role. Have we become too political? Have we lost touch with that which gives meaning to life? Among our Indian people, each tribe has teachings and values that children are taught as they grow up. If we abide by those principles, then we're keeping the hoop intact. When we deviate from our early teachings and become full of greed, working only for ourselves without being sensitive to the needs of anyone else, especially your own people, we have broken the sacred hoop. Keeping that hoop sacred is not imaginary. That's where our Indian people and non-Indians differ a lot. Non-Indians may know our ways and do our ceremonies, but to catch the real true spirit of our teachings is to keep the sacred hoop intact and real in our lives. It is something tangible to our spirits. In today's culture, the hoop has been broken in many places. What we're trying to do is repair it. The circle brings us closer together. It's a place where we can come together in harmony with a sense of blending, forgiving, loving, tolerating. If we can live that way, then perhaps our world, which is the greatest circle, might be a better place. The essence within you. In my tribe, one doesn't have to be a medicine person to be authorized to conduct a sweat lodge ceremony. Above all, you must be well thought of within your community. After watching your life, and your habits, the community must agree that you are the right person for it. When there's a gathering in my community, if there are any elders around, the younger one never says a word. I don't, even at my age, because I have many aunts and uncles and grandfathers back home in Oklahoma who are older than I am. In most places I travel to, I'm an elder, but when I get home, it's Hey, Sonny, come over here. If they're around, you won't hear a peep out of me until they say, go ahead, grandson. Would like to hear you speak to these people. All right, grandfather, I'll do my best. Good, good son, go ahead. I have to acknowledge all my elders first before I speak. That's the respect that we have. When you're speaking to an Indian community, your gestures, mannerisms, presentation, and voice intonations mean nothing. The people sit with their eyes closed and listen for the ethos, the ring of truth and honesty within you. Whether you're just talking or you're really saying something, they're asking themselves, what kind of a life does this man live? Is this person who backs up what he says by the way he lives his life, or does he just like to impress a lot of people? Is a responsible man able to handle groups of people like this? By the time you get through talking, they know more about you than you'll ever know about your audience. Conducting a sweat lodge ceremony cares with a lot of responsibility. You're responsible for everyone in there, their problems, their health, everything not only at that specific time, but in time to come. After the ceremony is over, you will sit, still be expected to back up the prayers that you made in there for them. 
You back it up, not only with other prayers, but by the way you live. When you come out of that lodge, it's quite a responsibility. The elders taught us, before you can lead, have a home. That home is a base of operation so that people know where to come and seek your help. If you're the kind that stays here a while and then all of a sudden you're over there and people are trying to catch up with you all over there, then over there again, your words and thoughts, prayers and power are going to be like that, dispersed all over the place. You may go through the emotions of leadership, but that's all. They're just motions. It's no substance to it. Your character and habits are not solid. Nokasel or Bear Paw, the Seminole elder who put me on the ant hill as part of my training, was a medicine man. A member of our tribe wanted to learn something from Bear Paw and extended an invitation to him. I want you to stay overnight at my home. So Bear Paw went all night at this man's house. They got up early in the morning and waited until his host finally got up too. The man said to him, breakfast is ready now. Why don't you come and eat? In my tribe, people usually talk after the meal. So when they finished eating, the host said, I'd like you to tell me anything you think I ought to know. All right, I'll tell you since you asked me. Bear Paw said, because you want to live in the community and be well thought of. I saw a lot of your implements lying around in the front yard. Put them together in a shed so you can find them in one place. There are a lot of odds and ends all over. Put those up. What Bear Paw was telling him in a nice way was to clean up his act. And since he had asked an elder, the man couldn't talk back to him. Before you learn to do anything else, learn to keep your home in order and gain respect as a responsible member of your community so that people will be glad to have you as a neighbor. That's the first lesson you need to learn. Until you do that, don't try to learn anything else. Your habits and behavior are what people know you by. If you sit in a responsible position, carry that responsibility with you in your life. We don't put shingles out saying doctor this and doctor of that. We learn by doing, by being. How do you keep yourself? How do you regulate your own life? When you give your word, do you live up to it? I have a friend in Florida whose name is Billy Osceola, and he's a minister of the Seminole Independent Baptist Church. There was a non-Indian minister from Illinois who was visiting Florida, and he invited Billy to speak in his church. When do you want me to come? Well, how about the first Sunday in April? Okay. This was in July, so it meant nine months off. I was living in Oklahoma City that next to April, and I got a call from Billy as he was passing through. He said, I'm on my way to Illinois. I'm going to preach for a friend I met from there. There had been no conversation or written correspondence of any kind since July, but Billy had given his word. A few days later, he came back through Oklahoma City. The man who invited him had forgotten, but Billy had given his word nine months before to go to Illinois, and he lived up to his part of the bargain. He didn't realize that in a white culture, most people would send a confirming letter and see if the date was still on. When Native people give their word, they don't have to have it notarized, they don't have to sign papers, and they don't have to confirm. That's why we as Indians call white people the paper tribe. Everything has to be written down on paper. You need birth certificates, diplomas, and resumes to prove who you are and what you've done. Reports must be in triplicate. One goes to that office, another goes to this office, another goes to the bathroom. You see, it's a waste. Give your word and live up to a word. That's the kind of responsibility I'm talking about. It doesn't come from books. It takes time, experience, and dedication. 
there's a certain responsibility that goes along any time that you are in a position to lead. It's as though everyone who comes in a sweat lodge is saying to you, I'm placing my life in your hands. I'm giving you my life. Will you help me? And so your responsibility for a whole armful of lives. There was a big revival meeting one time. They brought in an evangelist from out of state. A great deal of money was collected, and the deacons were going to turn this money over to the evangelist. But one of the deacons said, I don't know whether we should give all the money to the evangelist. Why not? For one full week, we've had only one convert. I don't know whether we ought to give all this money. They were discussing this among themselves when one of them said, If it doesn't feel right, don't give it to him. But whatever it is, I will match it and double it, because that one convert happened to be my grandson, and he's worth more than that to me. So how much is one life worth? A life that's entrusted to you as you sit in a position of leadership. You're responsible for every soul, every problem. That's what responsibility carries with it.